Hi guys, Red Rabbit here, and we're going to do another photo critique video. This time looking at Adrian's work, he's 12 years old and from Leeds in the UK, and shoots with a Canon 30D and an 18 to 55 kit lens. So Adrian's very kindly sent over some images, and we'll have a look at those now over in Lightroom. Okay, so here we are in Lightroom, or Lightroom 3, and we're going to have a look at Adrian's images. Um, he's sent seven images in total in. Um, in a good size or good resolution um, so we can have a look at some detail check that things are sharp and so forth as well um, so that's good thank you very much Adrian for sending these in now uh, as you guys know whenever I do these critiques I say what I think if something's bad I'll say it's bad but I will give some feedback along with that I'm not going to be harsh or point any fingers name call or anything like that I'm just going to call things as they are and give some feedback if there's anything that you don't agree on and I'd love to hear from you in the comments, in a video response, or via email as well. Um, so uh, we'll have a quick look at these images that Adrian has sent in. So we know from the introduction he shoots with Canon, a Canon 30D. That camera is no longer made, doesn't matter whatsoever. You can get some great prices for older cameras like the Canon 20D, 30D, and I'm sure models of other brands as well on the used market to get going. Um, as long as it's, it's a, a DSLR, it offers you that flexibility of interchangeable lenses as well uh, for a great price. So remember, it's not about the gear that you've got, it's how you use it and how you see um, your photos or your images that you make. So the first one that we'll have a look at here. Uh, now these are slightly out of order, it's the way that Lightroom's brought these in. Um, um, this one... Is actually describes this. This photo is when I sat down in my house and I did a photo of myself, so a self portrait of Adrian. So we'll have a quick look at this one now. And we can see um, it's been shot at ISO 1600 at f10, 125th of a second. Okay, and that's at 34 millimeters. He's using one lens, it appears at the moment, the Canon 18 to 55 kit lens, which is fine, that's all good. You get to know that lens get to know what it's good at and what it's not good at and its limitations um, and then you'll know what you want to go to okay so looking at this image um, it's converted to black and white um, not quite a true black and white I don't think it's got possibly a hint of sepia toning or something in there um, from what I can tell um, looking at the light source on this image it looks to be um, a natural light or window light image uh, so let's have a quick look so the, the the way to tell really is to have a look at the cash light and see I mean I can see a window there so I'm assuming it was a window light shot it's quite a large light source uh, quite open shadows on this side of the face if it was lit with off-camera flash we'd probably see the modifier being used say a square softbox or circular catch light for an umbrella now this was shot at f10 now f10 is a pretty closed down aperture and um, you're going to get a good amount of depth of field for that, so I'm not too sure you would um, really require f10 for a self-portrait, although you may want to stop down your lens to omit any focus errors when taking self-portraits, because it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do with SLRs, because you've got no way of seeing how you're composing your shot, because the screen um, is on the back of the majority of them, unless you've got one of the new ones. So as we zoom in on this image, let's have a quick look. Uh, we can see that focus isn't actually critically sharp on the eye. We can forgive Adrian for this because um, it's difficult to do. You know, when you've not got a screen um, to see how you're composed and a screen that you can flip around so you can possibly tell where focus is, it's quite difficult. One thing you can do to help you whilst taking self-portraits, if you do want to do any more, um, is you can pre-focus on something. What I usually do. Um, certainly when I'm making videos where I've got to stand in front of the camera is I set one of my light stands up um, set it up to about my eye height I make sure I stand level with it then I can focus on that that light stand and I know it's I'm on the same plane of focus then when I come to do the video I can just drop the stand down to a low position so it's not in shot so you can pre-focus on something to help um, obtain sharp focus that way so we've used ISO 1600 now 1600 on most modern DSLRs it's okay to use when you've got good light it can get a little bit noisy it's good to see Adrian that you're not afraid of using higher ISOs although you've had to use it in this instance because you closed down to f10 um, so um, it's probably to keep your shutter speed up now you may well have locked this down on a tripod 
so shutter speed doesn't really matter if it ends up going quite low although you would have to stay pretty still yourself um, framing wise quite nice type framing um, so that's good I don't know whether it's been cropped in post production or not um, but uh, I like quite tight framing on headshots it's an interesting angle of you um, looking down or you looking up at the camera as well um, so well done on that one and like I say it's not quite critically sharp on the eyes when doing portraiture even self portraiture it's nice to get focus on the eyes when we can certainly see the eyes in the image and try to focus on the eye which is close to camera in this instance they're both the same distance away they're on the same plane so no problem there um, watch also for your backgrounds as well I mean we can see a cushion or something here in the background it may have paid you to get rid of that and just have the the couch I think is or leather sofa whatever it is as the background so you've got a more consistent background there so uh, overall nice job um, I mean you've had to crank that ISO pretty high um, so and that's another thing another giveaway telling me it's a natural light shot because even though natural light can look quite bright at our human eyes to a camera it's still quite low especially if you're using window light indoors um, one other thing to watch as well is with your lenses okay you've got to watch how close you're working into your subjects now it's not the lenses that are at fault which can cause this distortion be that um, pincushion or barrel distortion or otherwise um, it's not the lens that's at fault it's your working distance that's one thing to watch There's a slight little bit of distortion because you're working fairly close in this one and um, because the focal length is relatively wide um, on that lens um, so just watch out for that okay not too bad at all though so we'll go to the next image there you go and this one's called the dark of Evie and uh, his description on this one is where are we um, this is when I I took this photo and during the exposure I shook the camera so he held it with one hand and shook the camera and this is quite interesting technique so um, kudos for experimenting with this stuff uh, still photography traditionally we certainly when we start out with it we start thinking of oh well things need to be frozen uh, we need a fast shutter speed to freeze action things have got to be stopped pin sharp and yes in many cases that's true um, but we can also use the opposite of that and slow the shutter speed down be that by closing down the aperture which drags down the shutter speed using a low ISO or in this instance in low light because he's taken this what looks like quite late in the evening or late in the day um, is increase the ISO and zoomed in on the kit lens at 55 millimeters which has automatically stopped down to 5.6 it's a variable aperture lens and that's given him a half a second thereabouts um, exposure and during that exposure time he's moved the camera during the exposure recording which gets some quite interesting results certainly when you've got some light in there like this um, I'm assuming it's lights on buildings maybe uh, street lamps and a combination of other lights in there as well it looks like you've got some people um, walking through the frame possibly if you've got some friends walking through the picture as well with some torches um, it'd be interesting to find out a little bit more on this one actually but it's a great experimental technique because the fun thing about doing things like this is you just don't know what you're gonna get every single shots gonna be different so you can experiment away um, long exposure photography can be really interesting um, it's a given when you're working in low light conditions you're exposure times are going to have to increase in terms of the length of time that the shutter is open to gather that light and you can get some quite interesting results so you know very very good shot I actually like this one because it's quite interesting it makes you wonder about what's happening in the scene and how you've gone about actually doing this um, I mean long exposure uh, photography can be done with any desk light, desk lamps, lamps you've got at home, simple little torches, keyring torches, anything that you've got to hand. You can do painting with light and writing with light or you can write words. Just remember you need to do it backwards because it's mirror image and it goes into the camera. Um, quick plug here for newtofoto.com. Um, we've Mark's actually done a tutorial about painting with light. It's actually live on the newtofoto.com blog now and it's on the YouTube channel new to photo. So uh, go and check that one out. So very very good job Adrian on this one. I actually this is probably the f my favorite of the series of images that you've taken. And again, kudos for not being afraid to use high ISOs. Okay. Um to get that result that you want. So uh, you know 
many, many people are very, very afraid of increasing the ISO. Oh, I'm going to get noise, I'm going to get noise. And yes, you will get some more noise, but people who are worried about noise in images when they increase the ISO are starting to view their images at 100%. They'll zoom in and they'll pixel peep and they'll look, oh my, there's noise in the blue channel, there's noise there. Seriously, don't worry about it. You know, it's the, these settings are part of the toolkit that comes along with your camera and you're going to have to vary these settings and use combinations of to get the results that you want. So I really do like this one Adrian, very very good job here. Um, I actually like the framing even though the framing is kind of loose because obviously you're going to move the camera during the exposure. Um, so very very good job on that one. So I mean if you wanted to you could probably even give this image the title I mean which you have, the Dark of Eevee or the Dark of Eevee. Um, and you could probably maybe Photoshop or do a watermark with the title. At the top here you've got this black area in this image, um, negative space, should you wish to do that. So uh, very, very good job as well. So we'll go to the next one. Okay, this one here is... Doo -doo -doo, if I can find it. Sorry, these are in the wrong order. So the, the list I've got printed is a bit different. Ah, it's of a horse at this farm, he says. Okay. So I'm assuming this is a farm maybe which is quite close by. Now before I start going into any detail on this image, one thing to say is well done spotting good light. Okay, It looks like it was taken fairly late in the day, or maybe even early in the day. Uh, the sun's quite low in the sky, so you've got this nice sunlight hitting um, the subject here. Um, it's you know it's this split lighting, so this half of the horse is lit and this half isn't, but it's all part of your photography, you know, it's all based on light, on how you expose for light, on how you see light and deliver it. Um, so good job on that one. Now if I actually scroll down here, does it tell me the time it was taken? Yep, there you go. 6 o'clock in December 2011. Um, sorry, 4 o'clock in um, December 2011. So that's going to be towards the end of the day where that sun is going to be starting to hit the horizon and we end up in the golden hour. Whoops, I've gone back to the other one. Okay, now looking at this image, putting your subject in the centre frame can often be said to be as um, you know a mistake. Don't do it. I'll argue against that and say sometimes it does work. Um, I've put something up recently of my own on a personal project that I've started where my subject is framed dead centre in the frame, and for various reasons. So compositional rules learn them and then you can break them. Now with this one it would work being centered in the frame for me certainly um, if the background was a little bit cleaner. That said you don't really have that much control over the background um, in a situation like this. If a horse is maybe moving towards you up to a barbed wire fence and uh, there's rocks, twigs, sticks and so forth in the field behind it you can't really hop the fence and go and clean that up before you take the picture because chances are the horse is going to be off skis and run away. Um, so, but that's just a couple of tips to bear in mind there. I like the symmetry of this, ignoring what's in the background. You know, you know the horse is looking pretty much straight on. We've got symmetry, and the, you can see this side of the horse's body coming around here, and this side here. Yes, there is a difference in the degree of lighting. That's fine. That's just a type of lighting, split lighting, um, and that's all good. One thing to note on this one. Okay, you've used the kit lens at 55 millimeters at f7.1. Now, f7.1 you think, well that's going to give us quite a big depth of field. True, but as you increase your focal length and you, you work relatively close to your subject, you're going to get a shallower depth of field at any given aperture. And this is why we're starting to get the background going out of focus uh, in this image here. Um, ignoring what I've said about the background, I mean, watch out for distractions which would take people's eyes away from your subject. Uh, when you're composing them, that said, sometimes you've just got to take the shot because you can't control those things. And taking a shot and getting something's better than having nothing. Um, now, this was taken at a hundredth of a second at ISO 100. You probably could have done with increasing your ISO to gather a bit more light to increase your shutter speed on this one. Because I'm noticing that it's a little blurry. You know, if we zoom in here, and that's either going to be down to subject movement or camera shake. Now I'm going to say it's camera shake on this um, given the fact that the barbed wire is yes it's blurry, it's out of focus but there's also a hint of camera shake here kind of a haziness about it or ghosting if you like and that's probably maybe because you've turned around quite quick to grab the shot 
before the cameras come to a finishing lock position. So you've got to compose your shot and then lightly press on the shutter, even when you're working at a hundredth of a second of a shutter speed. Okay, it's amazing you can still get camera shake. You can definitely get camera shake when working at slower shutter speeds. So good technique, controlling your breathing, holding the camera nice and steady, supporting it with uh, your left arm. I mean, I, this is how I do it, support it in my left arm, bring it in, mash it into my eye, my right eye, and then lightly press the shutter as I exhale if I'm working at slower shutter speed. It's surprising where you can still get camera shake, so watch out for that. So good work on that one, just a few pointers. Um, still my favourite one so far is your Dark of Eevee, long exposure one. Good job on that. Now we've got another long exposure one next here called Buses. And um, again, the shutter's been dragged. Okay, it's called dragging the shutter or using a slow shutter speed. And so as the bus has gone past, um, with its lights on the side of the vehicle, on the front of the vehicle, and maybe other traffic's gone past as well, it creates this nice streak across the image here, uh, which kind of leads the eye from the top of this frame down the road here. Now, that said, at the moment, we can't really see anything where the bus is leading to, apart from some possibly street lights or building or house lights over here. So there's a lot of dead space. Now, I'm a big fan of negative space, but when it's used correctly, um, you've used ISO 1600, <coughs> excuse me, 1600. Um, that's because you've stopped down the apertures to F22. And you could have done this by opening up the apertures to say F8, you know, and then dropping your ISO down uh, accordingly. You don't necessarily have to use a high ISO. You're going to be using a long shutter speed, so you're either going to have to be very steady hand holding it. I mean, four seconds is too long to hand hold or brace yourself on a wall, put the camera on a wall or on a tripod. So you could have actually dropped your ISO down in this instance. Um, but because talking about noise, and generally I don't worry about it too much, but where it will show up in images first is shadow areas, okay, and in the darks and the darker tones. Now this can be cleaned up in Lightroom, and um, you said that you've run these images through Lightroom as well, um, but uh, I use noise reduction generally quite sparingly myself because it can start to soften the images up. Um, but I quite like this one still. Um, it's, it seems to be something that you enjoy experimenting with, so I would certainly work on that some more and just see what you can get. Um, I mean, a, a typical shot that you see doing this kind of thing is um, set your camera up on a tripod where it's over a bridge, over a motorway at night. Uh, give yourself a couple of second exposure, say, three or four second exposure you could go longer if you wanted to um, you're probably going to go wide angle to fit all of the motorway in and whatever is in the background as well and if you do it at the right time of day you can balance a long exposure with the last light of the night where you get a nice deep blue sky and you can get those traffic streaks going away or coming towards you or actually probably both really <laughs> because motorways have two runs of traffic so good job on that go experiment some more with that one I'm not too keen on this because it's really loose in terms of on the framing and this just all goes to black here but principles again um, good job on that you could have opened up your aperture a bit more on this one. Oh, one thing as well you'll notice when in a lot of long exposure um, photography you'll start to see some lights certainly fixed lights like street lamps start to starburst okay and that's not some kind of filter that you fit on the camera now that's actually because your aperture is stopped down as a result of that aperture being closed down so okay so we'll go on to the next one um, there we go do out snow okay and this was taken on your deck I believe um, in your garden and you've then converted this to mono or black and white and you've used an aperture of f10 at ISO 1600 250th of a second okay um, I quite like the texture of this, there's snow on what seems to be possibly gravel or maybe some kind of mud um, that's on there, it's either that or it's the rough um, pads or rubber finishes you can get for decking to stop them being slippy so you don't fall over um, and that works quite well. I'm not too sure it's the best frame of it um, here to be honest with you. Um, like I say I like the texture and the contrast used so good job on that one. Uh, but I'm not too sure on the framing. I think possibly you could have 
work get your frame in to fill the frame so we don't have the black bits down here and we just have more of this textured area and um, because this top section is not really doing too much for me um, at the moment uh, I mean it, you may well have worked framing it like this possibly to crop these lower sections out if you had uh, someone stood there so you had their feet boots maybe or some other kind of form of interest in this top left third that may well have worked and um, I've noticed you've shot this ISO 1600 again so, well he's not afraid of using the high ISOs good job uh, 55 millimeters at f10 now if you're wondering why has he got out of focus area here and the background at f10 okay could be a few reasons I mean you could post product use post-production to create the blur or you can do it in camera which is the way to do it all the time and uh, working close in go telephoto is going to give you a shallow depth of field at any given aperture like I said before so you can still get shallow depth of field even when using the kit lens at apertures like f5.6 f5.8 okay so, uh, not my favorite one in the series um, although I do say it's like I said, I like the texture and the contrast within this. So there's definitely something there. And maybe next time it snows, because I believe the snow is now all gone, um, it, you could possibly head out and uh, have another go at that one. Okay. So actually, one thing I want to do is just zoom in on this. Uh, not so much check for sharpness. No, that's fine. Okay. One thing I've noticed in a couple of your images, Adrian, is um, a little bit of over sharpening. Now, it's evident in this image here, but more so in the next one, uh, the picture of these leaves. Okay, and uh, looking at it in this size, it looks fine, you know, nice and sharp. But we can tell when we zoom in, ooh, slow computer, that we're starting to see artifacts and evidence of over sharpening. You start to get this patterned effect um, within the image. Okay, so that really has been over sharpening you need to back off on the sharpening on that one uh, to uh, remove some of that pattern uh, so usually what I would do I do my sharpening at 100 percent in Lightroom and I just take it to a point where it just snaps sharp and then just a little bit further and that's fine even for larger prints um, as well it works well so you've taken a picture of a leaf and that's uh, 53 millimeters which is nearly the longest on that lens, uh, f5.6, ISO 400, okay, to keep that shutter speed up, although you've got some headroom, uh, the shutter speed's quite fast there. And um, again, that working distance has created a shallow depth of field, even at f5.6. Now, you've put your subject dead center in the frame. I said before, it can work in this, it doesn't really do much. Um, it, the background's just too distracting. Uh, I'm not saying that you wouldn't necessarily want to include the other leaves and branches. Chances are you're gonna have, not going to have a lot of choice, uh, depending on how um, populated the tree or the branches with leaves. Um, but you can probably work to get a better composition here, because um, the background is just as important as a subject in a lot of things, um, because it can become distracting. Yes, when you take a background and throw it out of focus, uh, probably more so than this, then okay that can eliminate the distractions but um, you can certainly work to do that uh, within your compositions but the main point on this one is the over sharpening it's just really apparent especially when you zoom in so I would do that sharpening very very gradually working at 100% just until you see it snap to sharp and that's absolutely fine you know you can print, you'll be able to print A4 prints from that even larger and it will look perfectly sharp so we'll go to the next image now this is probably my second favourite one um, of the series that Adrian has sent in. Okay, Snow Woods. And uh, where are we? So this was taken on the 5th of February at half one in the afternoon. Okay, so the sun at half one in the afternoon is going to be quite high up in the sky. And we can tell because of the way that the shadows are falling. And um, cutting through the other trees and branches, the shadow lines or lines falling from highlight to shadow are quite hard because it's hard light. Uh, that full afternoon sun is hard light and in this way it works because it it offers up interest within the landscape. Okay, It's lighting part of these humps, rocks or whatever the roots may be that they are and causing shadow because they come up from the ground and then drop off so you get lit side and then darker side and it kind of makes that that landscape or that floor stand out. 
Now, one quick tip that I want to give when shooting pictures of snow is that it can fool your camera's meter. Camera's meters are pretty stupid. Um, if you have a look at an overall primarily bright white scene, it's going to underexpose it because the camera's meter is working to that 18% grey. So it's going to try and get that bright white to 18% grey and underexpose it. The flip side is if you've got a dark scene, it's going to try and overexpose it to get it to that 18% grey. So if it's looking at a scene that's primarily black, darker tones, it's going to increase exposure to do that. So you have to tell the camera, no, I actually need more or less. Okay, in this instance, you would actually need to increase exposure by about one stop thereabouts, different for different scenes. And working with dark subjects, you would need to decrease exposure by one stop. That's usually the starting point. I go to uh, two thirds to one stop and then I fine tune from there. But I do like this one. Now, I will say that this has got tons of contrast in the scene. It looks like you've gone quite heavy on the contrast um, and black levels anyway. I mean, however you develop and process your images, that's down to your personal taste. And given your age, Adrian, I mean, you've, you've only been shooting for two years. In the grand scheme of things, it's not really that long. I've been shooting for seven or eight years, and that's not that long. So, you know, your style per se, or the way that you work your files and how you shoot in camera is going to develop and change over the years. Um, but a little too heavy on the contrast for me, anyway. And we can see that the a lot of black clipping, okay, around here. Backing off on the contrast will help with that, or maybe decreasing the level slightly. Um, but I do quite like this image. I like I like I like looking at the patterns and on the on the ground works well in the balance on the trees. You've got this one here composed, you know, within a third. You've got the lower third in the, in the snow and as and this rocky or root section here within the middle third and the top third then goes up to the trees. So I quite like it. I think this will make quite an interesting print. Probably just reprocessed to ease off on the contrast. Now I'm just going to zoom in on this. Uh, we've shot this at f4.5, okay, at 33 millimeters, a fairly wide focal length, um, which is going to give a good depth of f4.5, so that's fine. And uh, that's absolutely fine. It's probably just a little over sharpened, like you did earlier, okay. Um, but we've already talked about that. But I do really like that one. So this one and your, where are we? The dark of Evie. Um, so my favourite. It's my absolute favourite. Um, of the series that you sent in definitely so good job on that one now hopefully i've given you some feedback to think about um remember don't take any of this personally anyone who i do a review for or critique for i'm just telling it like it is and um, if i see something and i think it's over sharp i'll tell you if i think it's not sharp enough i'll tell you and i'll throw in tips about techniques and how to improve certain in certain situations as well so hopefully more not just the person who's sending the critiques gains from this but other people who watch them do i appreciate they are a little bit long these critiques but i wanted to do some where i give some good feedback and not just do a five or eight minute quick quick critique where really it doesn't really do any, do any justice so thank you very much for sending those in adrian um i'd love to hear some feedback from you about this critique um be that via email um, or a comment on the video or a video response um so i'd love to hear from you um, keep shooting, keep on experimenting, certainly with stuff like this, the long exposures. You know, there's tons of stuff that you can do um, regarding this stuff, be it around based around portraiture, uh, landscape stuff, painting with light. You can paint landscapes with flash, torches, big head, even car headlights as well could be used. Um, so you may be able to rope mum or dad in to help you with that. Um, so good job. So thank you very, mu very much for watching, everybody. Um, this has been a critique of Adrian's work from Leeds, and because it just goes to show that um, you know it doesn't matter what gear you use, what lens that you use, you can still get some great results, and um, it also doesn't matter what age, you know, how long you've been shooting, um, you can still just put your stuff out there, grow and learn as you go along. Like I say, your style, I mean, just your style takes years to develop, but the way that you shoot and process images will change and will improve over time. Um, Try and shoot raw if you can do. I expect using Lightroom Adrian, you are shooting raw already. And that gives you the most leeway on correcting problems in post-production and if you've made mistakes in camera. Or more flexibility should you want to re-edit images later on in life 
um, to produce something different. So uh, good job on that. Thank you very much for watching. And I will catch you guys in the next critique. Also, uh, don't forget to subscribe to New to Photo and NTP Advanced on YouTube. Check out the website, ntpadvanced.com. And you can also find me on my website, which is rjbradbury.com, and on Twitter, at rjbradbury.